namaste and greetings i swati solanki researcher at impri impact and policy research institute prabhav evam niti anusandhan sansthan nai delhi extend my warm welcome to you all to impri hashtag web policy talk today we have gathered for a special talk on practitioner reflections on the data and evidence ecosystem as a part of the series the state of statistics hashtag data discourses the series is organized by generation alpha data center at impri it is my privilege to introduce the chair for our session pc mohanan who is former acting chairperson national statistical commission government of india our eminent speaker for today's talk is abiru bhunia so is an independent development practitioner and it supports evidence based decision making through research and monitoring evaluation and learning he has worked closely with bilateral and multilateral donor agencies the private sector and governments in various developmental sectors covering a diverse range of policy matters he is masters from the university of sussex uk now i request the chair of our session pc mohanan to take our discussion forward over to you sir thank you thank you sadi and let me welcome group and uh, all the others uh, and express my happiness that the institute impri is organizing this uh, initiated this dialogue series of dialogues and i think the third one i am probably uh, listening to and uh, so that is a very welcome uh, step especially in the current situation when data has become data has taken the center stage in all debates and all discussions especially in the last one or two years we have seen for a variety of reasons one is you can say uh, and in fact uh, i think most of you may be aware that the world development report of the world bank this year is actually on data uh, data for better lives that is the title of the report and that covers a very wide spectrum of uh, issues uh, and i think some of the things are very relevant uh, in the current context the wdr was started initiated much before the covid pandemic but the pandemic has made the issues relating to data much more important much more serious to be taken by almost everybody yeah. and all along we have been worried to about data for variety of reasons uh, either the darker side or the data would violate your privacy or it might be used for surveillance or it may be used for uh, making profits by some uh, unscrupulous people uh, there is a other one side and the other brighter side is all of us know that that can improve the government policies discussions and discourses and also help people to make improved uh, uh, better choices uh, in all uh, issues so there are both the bright and the dark side that has been in the discussion all along and we also had a data protection bill which has been debated for some time one good thing i have seen is that you know uh, especially in the last uh, one year the data has been you know, is being taken up for discussion almost on a hourly basis you can say uh, when i started looking or studying the government statistics about 40 years back or uh, i never thought the issues like the civil registration system or the sample registration system or the med you know, medical certification of course of the statistics i never thought these statistics would ever be discussed in a public journal or newspapers but now every day this is only thing you find you know, people trying to estimate the excess death using this uh, civil registration or the sample registration and other things so this used to be such boring subjects when we joined you know nobody would look at these numbers or i don't i never found any any economist rather ever interested in these numbers in those days but now these numbers have taken a center stage and you know all of us are really seeing the utility of these numbers so that is one uh, and same thing applies to unemployment data or the economic growth or the impact of these lockdowns and so many issues now all of them is has now come out of the government uh, area now these are all being discussed in the journalist uh, journalist uh, or what we call data journalism you know, which is available in all the uh, channels now so it is a good thing that you know data has come to really occupy the center stage and it is in this view being a government statistician uh, i am very keen to look at how the uh, you know people like abru looks at the whole issues now because we are trained and we have been uh, spent our lifetime look only collecting data 
Uh, and uh, we never saw this kind of a debate, which could have certainly improved the government machinery of collecting data if it had happened much earlier. But now the situation has come that the government is slightly, you know, uh, uh, government has left out a lot of gaps now. The government has left a vacuum, especially in the question uh, when it comes to data. And this vacuum is now being filled up by uh, practitioners uh, and the journalists and also by uh, universities now, like the Simpreb University only the day before they had uh, inaugurated a, a data portal or the Saga universities. All these uh, you know, institutes, the search areas are actually filling up the vacuum that has been uh, caused by the government's own uh, you know, less interest or lack of interest or other issues in the area of data. So I'm very keen to listen to uh, what the group has to say as a development practitioner and what his reflections are on the current state of things, the way as an outsider, how, how does he view the things? Uh, which will be of interest to all of us. And let me again congratulate uh, the MPRI for uh, taking up these issues. And I think this will continue. This is, you know, this dialogue and process will continue. And we'll have more people uh, uh, joining us in the coming days. And this material will also be available, uh, you know, in, uh, in the YouTube so for the researchers can also later on access it and use it for the purpose. So I will invite uh, Dr. Abhiru Bunia to start his presentation. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, um, okay. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much, uh, Mohanan, sir. You are a veteran yourself. And I think um, the fact that I'm able to sort of state my views, uh, you know, in your presence itself uh, increases the honor that much. I want to clarify, and this I had to clarify once before to Dr. As well, that I'm not a uh, doctorate, so I, you know, I'm a practitioner. So you know, while it's flattering, it's factually incorrect. Um, uh, I will start uh, sharing my uh, slides, but before that, I want to, uh, you know, state a few things. One is, uh, of course, when Doctor Kumar, you know, invited me to sort of give this talk. Um, I looked at the agenda and it did seem uh, very pertinent. Um, I work in the development space for people who are not in the development space, essentially they call refer to it as social sector. So essentially my domain is very much limited to one particular area where data and evidence matters. And Do we have a problem? It froze. I will coordinate. Uh, can you hear me? Sorry, the power just went up and it's very typical these days in Delhi. Uh, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Because of rain, okay. Okay. no problem. Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I was saying, yeah. So I think I'll just dive straight into my presentation now and I, uh, you know, and then we can discuss. And I hope this fits into the overall agenda of your series and it does uh, at least some justice to it. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, it's on. Yes. 
Yes, it's working. You change the slide bottom left. Okay. Um, so I will. Yeah, fine. Um, I'm getting a yeah, no worries. Um, so I'll mention the WDR, which I also had the opportunity to glance through. And I know I've sort of borrowed the terminology that WDR has used this time with respect to public intent data and private intent data. And uh, which I liked particularly uh, in terms of the conceptualization. So, you know, one of the things that we often do in terms of uh, while we support the paradigm of this, um, and if you look at, I mean, obviously the common picture of what one understands when they speak of data is basically a number, which is basically quantitative data. Uh, but then there is also qualitative data, which, and this is one of the central pieces of my argument today, which adds value to uh, the evidence generation process. And in my discussions with um, decision makers, I've often felt that uh, it lends a certain meaning to them and it makes it actionable for them rather than just saying, okay, here is the broad trend of coverage of uh, schemes. This is what is happening on the ground in terms of some. So I've just tried to pictureize what we broadly mean when we say evidence, at least in the public uh, policy sphere. So, and the color shading, essentially what I want to say is that, you know, we are already quite up there and again, I want to emphasize this is not the national, this is not the uh, NSSO, unemployment, employment service, not those kinds of work, but some of the micro level stuff that happens across states um, and districts in support of particular policy questions. Um, so we are quite up there in terms of conducting quantitative surveys. Uh, my experience in traveling through the hinterland uh, for you know, monitoring these surveys have been that in fact, there is quite, a, quite an overdose of surveys uh, often they're repetitive. Um, they're obviously very quite costly uh, an affair. And one of the things which has gained traction recently is administrative data. Again, this is something the WDR uh, focuses on a little bit, but overall administrative data has taken center stage. And I want to sort of through this talk, reiterate the potentials of existing administrative data, uh, which is quantitative in nature. And also uh, the importance of conducting, integrating more qualitative data into the evidence generation process to make it more meaningful and actionable. In, so I want to situate this whole debate. Uh, in, I don't too much on private data, but in order to situate the conceptualization of how data and its meaning has changed, I want to also slightly talk in market research um, essentially meant you go and do surveys of people and ask them what cigarettes do you like to smoke, just as an example. You know, but if you look at big tech and the paradigm of big data today, um, and if we take an, without taking any names of, uh, you know, uh, corporates, if you look at some of the big players in terms of, um, in the big tech space, whether it is e-commerce space, whether it is, um, you know, uh, you know, digital finance services and so on, the amount of data that they have and the ability to actually um, use that data to feed us more and more tailored products um, is quite something. And it really, uh, you know, lends credence to the idea that the same records data that is available in public space in a very different manner. If we tap into it more and more, uh, I think there is a wealth of what you call um, you know, latent evidence already available, but it's just a matter of uh, synthesizing it and producing it as uh, as an evidence to support any kind of policy decisions. So administrative data, I want to, um, uh, you know, discuss, uh, yeah, I want to discuss a few features and traits of what administrative data looks like. Essentially what we're talking about is there is, through the operation of various government schemes, programs, which are very large in nature. And by virtue of the fact that this program exists and by virtue of the 
fact that day after day these programs, programs are implemented uh, in the public policy sphere through its various touch points without the intention to collect any data as such. There's a lot of records um, that essentially uh, feed into a stack of data, which is essentially administrative data. Now, but then there are three main questions which I feel are important. One is the discoverability, which essentially how I conceptualize it as, you know, is looking at the data and thinking whether this has the potential to generate any structured evidence for supporting policy. Once that, that potential has been discovered, I think there is a question of accessibility, which is that, you know, one is the physical sometimes the formats in which such data is available and very rich data you know access to that data or sometimes it's a question of access to that data simply in the manner of how forthcoming any government department or even a particular let's say a district project management unit how forthcoming are they going to be in terms of sharing that data to generate evidence and in terms of data sharing, it's a huge debate. You know, it's a very separate kind of a debate. Uh, you know, data sharing protocols, open data, and so on. I'm not, uh, you know, getting into that so much. But you know, my personal view here would be that I will not decry anybody who's saying that you know I'm a little touchy about putting out all my data on a website. That is ideal, perhaps. But you know, perhaps a more intermediate step would be that the data is available. And on special you know, request by, uh, let's say, a civil society member, a researcher, agency, or any uh, consultant who's uh, working closely with the government, uh, gets access to that data, uh, to the full data. Because sometimes what we have is that we only have summary data. Um, and then there's a question of quality. I'll come to that. But I also want to emphasize that you know, when we do surveys, there's a question of representation. Um, I think with administrative data, that is almost achieved by default because there is, a new, there is a nature of universality in terms of how these programs are implemented. I mean, obviously there is an eligibility criteria for a program or a scheme, but you know, within that eligibility criteria, it is by definition quite you know, fully represented because it's everybody's data, we're not sampling. And then a big uh, you know, elephant in the room is perhaps the question of quality. Uh, and the biggest two questions of quality to my mind from my experience of looking at uh, district and state level data is the question of missing data or data which is available in unstandardized formats. So, so that makes it very difficult to sort of uh, do anything. So the cleanup process may be there, but if, if data is missing, that's an entirely different uh, complex scenario altogether. And this happens for a multiplicity of reasons. Um, yeah. So I'll just take an example because this often eases out the general, general way in which we talk about things. So let's take the examples of, um, let's say rural level missions which operate across many states. And let's take the example of self-help groups which are basically the you know, lowest unit in these rural level missions. And many states as we know are sort of already looking at complete digitalization process, by which I mean that um, the, the entire process of bookkeeping uh, is getting digitized. Sometimes it is digitized by nature. So, if, you know, so, so one member of an SEG has a tablet and it's directly filled in there. But more often it's about Taking the manual data from that khata or whatever the book and transferring it uh, into a MI system. So what what this does is in, in your digital the digitalization actually you know encompasses not only regular operations data but also the transactions data. So one of the benefits this is that in terms of the evidence is that it's not a new process. Existing process um, is being leveraged and only, only digitized. So there is no new evidence or data architecture, investment resources to collect data. All of that stuff is not required at all. 
we are just leveraging an existing system and trying to see potential for evidence in that. Some, some connection issues again, I will check. Um, really sorry, I again got disconnected, uh, but can, can someone please confirm that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I mean, yes. Um, and I'm going to share my screen once again. Um, yes, you can keep your camera off so that some while having screen. Yeah, it's, I think it's off. Yeah, it's off. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, yeah, what I was saying is that, um, so on the evidence potential, I think, you know, using the example of SDG, what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, we all know how SDGs operate. They, are, they meet regularly. They're supposed to meet regularly. Then there's a process of interloaning. There's a process of regular savings. There's bank linkage and so on and so forth. Typically what happens is if we want data on financial inclusion, if we want data on rural microenterprises, what we do is we try to think of conducting some kind of a primary survey. That is usually our first response when we think of, you know, generating evidence. But the very fact that all of this administrative data is available, I think inherently has an evidence generation potential, which there's a merit in at least moving the needle in terms of the discourse of the acceptability of administrative data. I, I, I also want to focus a little bit on the other potentials of such processes, which is that if you make the administrative data reliable, high quality, routine, and structured, there are other benefits to it. So for example, in this case, the one benefit that I can immediately think of is that it generates a reliable credit history, which is useful for banks and digital service providers uh, as external actors to then leverage. Um, I have mapped some indicative quantitative indicators on which we can potentially get reliable data if the administrative data you know, ecosystem improves. So what are these things? We can get data on SH demographics. We can get data on their financial performance. What is the status of savings, interloaning? What, is, you know, what are some of the reasons people are taking loans? Um, you know, what about fund receipts? So there's a you know, revolving fund and a CIF that is you know, that SHGs are supposed to receive. What is the status of fund received utilization? If there is any anomaly on that, status of credit linkages with banks, history, transactions, even things like profiling of enterprises, what is the status of revenue, income, profits, even non-financial things like, you know, how frequently people are meeting. So there'll be timestamps, there'll be discussion topics, um, there'll be, you know, be meeting frequencies will automatically be recorded. The duration of meetings will be recorded. When data is not available, you can make the conclusion that there is a question of functionality or non-functionality of SHGs. And then you will obviously get a lot of disaggregated data in terms of locational factors and other factors which might you know, bear upon the performance of um, SHGs, for example. And this I've just used an example. It can be anything. It can be an Anganwadi centers. It can be about adolescent girls and whether they're getting take-home rations and so on and so forth. I wanted to... Um, you know, this is by by design, I have put the slide once again here. So the other point that I want to make here is that, you know, is about primary qualitative data. Um, but I want to settle the point on administrative data is that, you know, administrative data has a strong potential in my view to complement uh, the evidence ecosystem. There is no question of replacing one or the other. But perhaps there is a question of rationalization of primary data collection. Perhaps there's a question of thinking whether this data is available. Uh, but perhaps there's a question of thinking of ways to actually improve the system's own data rather than saying, oh, you know, obviously we know the MIS is really bad in bad shape. We know that HMIS is in bad shape. We know that you know, perhaps that Manrega, you know, MIS is not giving us the real data. So as a reaction to that, often we tend to say, okay, then let's do a survey, you know, but perhaps in terms of at least discourse, there should be more efforts in, in towards thinking, how do we actually improve the capacity, quality, strength, uh, you know, uh, the quality assurance processes of the administrative data itself. 
and digitalization is just one of the many things that can be done in this. There is a whole question of you know uptake of data, whether there is adequate demand, whether you know there's a cultural shift in moving towards uh, you know having a real time data generation, um, and so on and so forth. These are not low hanging fruits, of course. These many of these are sort of very sticky problems. I'll talk a little bit about you know, because my whole proposition is how we can strengthen the evidence ecosystem. Uh, the, my second proposition really is that um, we need more research that is integrative of qualitative nuances. So to, to do that really, we need to, I mean, there's a lot of open debates on this one and I really, I should have stated this at the very beginning. I don't claim to have all the answers and neither do I intend for this talk to be the last word. What I really intend for this to do is as a contribution to an ongoing conversation of what evidence-based policy should look like. Um, so what is evidence really? Very commonly, what you know, when we talk about evidence, particularly in the context of monitoring and evaluation, is we want to see what works. So let's say there is a scheme which has been introduced five years have gone past, and we want to see whether it did work. That's fair enough. I mean, obviously that's a big part of it, but there are a few other things uh, which are important. What are these? And these are slightly complex. So it's not just about whether, I mean, whether something works or not, because the question then is whether we're looking at something working at an aggregate level. That is perhaps not the full picture. We need to understand why it did work. And if it did not, why it did not? Who did it work for? Are there people who are left out? Are there people for whom it did not work out? So averages obviously don't tell us the story. Under what circumstances did it work? And if at all there is a success story, what is the story behind it? I mean, what is the chain of impact or what is known as the mechanism of impact? Is it really that straightforward that X happened and therefore there's an impact and therefore we should do X? So one of the things, you know, in the discourse of realist, realist approaches to evidence generation, many people have pointed out that we have certain imagery in our minds about what is a gold standard evidence. And without naming anybody or any particular entity or any particular method, I would like to say that evidence doesn't really operate in any bubble. There is a real political economy environment within which evidence has to operate. So the question of what is the evidence? Is it timely? Is there demand for uptake? What are the competing interests and incentives which may, you know, which may perhaps improve the uptake of the evidence, but also may, you know, act as a barrier. There are questions of power dynamics and there are questions of social norms. None of this stuff can actually be captured in numbers. That is a hard reality, which has been increasingly being accepted within the discourse on evidence generation. Now, let's take a hypothetical, pure, and I, there's a reason why I have said hypothetical in bold. Um, it's, it's actually very fictional. So um, let's say fortified take home rations, increased nutrition levels of girls and girls in five rural districts in state S. And let's for a moment think that uh, the evidence is that an intervention has worked because A, B, and C outcomes have been fulfilled by 10%, 12%, 15%, 15%, for example. And therefore, an automatic policy takeaway is assumed, which is to say that therefore, perhaps X may be adopted, potentially replacing Y, which is already oper operational, but it's already happening in state A's. Um, but then, you know, what we have to understand that there are, there is, you know, the bridge towards, the bridge that connects evidence and policy is actually very long. And there are many pitfalls, which need to be sort of, um, you know, what do you call it? You, you need to jump over those. So what are those real world complications? And again, this is only fictional. So for example, there's a firm which is interested in manufacturing DHR packets. And there's, a, you know, so I'm thinking from the shoes of a policymaker who's sitting at the level of the state, for example. And then the questions which complicate this evidence are as follows. There's a question of investment, there's a question of employment. There's a question of what other interest groups are out there, which might, uh, you know, be a determinant of whether that evidence really matters. 
what about local politics? What about the timing of the evidence? Is the evidence timed well to actually support a policy decision? Now, there are other complications. For example, you know, there can be competing evidence, right? So for example, there's a decentralized model, which is led by SHGs, wherein locally, um, you know, take home rations are being procured, produced and packaged. And there is evidence that this leads to women empowerment and economic opportunities uh, at the very local and micro level. There is other competing evidence that suggests that perhaps these um, will have questions of quality, potentially they're unstandardized. And if one SHG is supplying to let's say one or two villages, then is, is there a question of potential, you know, having at the exact nutrient value differing as you move from one district or one village to the other? It's an entirely fictional story, but it, my, my point is to drive home the scenario of how a real world policy making situation looks like. And it's really not about, um, you know, that this is the data, look at this. You know, a data can scream anything, but there are many other considerations that need to be taken into account while we eventually present an evidence piece hoping to be influencing policy. Some of the really real world complexities are actually in the pathways to change also. So for example, you know, information uh, overload, it, is, it, it won't be right to assume linear pathways to change. So for example, you're saying there's an intervention X and due to that, an outcome occurred. No matter how complicated and rigorous your designs are, the fact of the matter is there could have been n number of things that happened within that pathway to change, which is often called the black box of process. Um, secondly, there is the multiplicity of stakeholders. Um, you know, John Drays had written in this piece, uh, you know, critiquing, wouldn't you say critiquing, I mean, he was reflecting on uh, the state of evidence and he used the example of uh, eggs, uh, using eggs in midday meals and the evidence that that has a, has a, has a, you know, increases nutrition levels, which is a given, nothing new in that. But there are many complications when policymakers consider these things. There's complications of vegetarianism, there's caste dynamics, there's power dynamics, there's a dynamic of whether there is a poultry, um, you know, lobby, so on and so forth. So multiplicity of stakeholders is important. So that needs to be understood. There are varying interests and incentives uh, that actually operate within a given time. Um, and therefore, you know, I really want to reiterate that the evidence that we generate doesn't really operate in a bubble. Um, unless, of course, we are looking at strictly academic research, which is not even my forte. So I'm not going to comment on that. So there are many unknowns. You know, in some, there are many unknowns uh, when we uh, talk about evidence. Um, combining my two key points on firstly, administrative data and then the requirement for primary quality data, I want to sort of try and see if I can summarize a few takeaways. Um, firstly, I would say when we talk of evidence generation, the first port of call needs not be surveys. And there are many reasons for that. And, you know, I've written about this before. The reasons include cost. They include the question of self-reported data, um, which may or may not be correct. Um, there is the question of who in the household or the establishment is respondent in your survey. Um, and then there are other operational questions, which is a survey takes time. You plan a survey and, you know, even if you're planning a survey of 2000 households covering five districts, um, it is a time taking process. Um, so timeliness is a factor in today's world. If you are trying to influence policy through evidence. Um, and there's a question of cost. There's a question of repetition. I have seen, I've been to villages in, uh, you know, particularly in North India, where there has been such an overkill of surveys uh, conducted by various agencies, social security organization, researchers, so on and so forth, that, you know, I wouldn't want to say, but the respondents really know why you're coming and they really understand why you are there. And some of the questions they 
are able to answer before you ask the question. And this, and there is a question of respondent fatigue also. And this is these are operational questions, and sometimes people who design surveys perhaps don't know, but the, you speak to the field guys, they know it. Um, now, so therefore, what? Therefore, what? I, my, my sense is, and I have, you know, in this entire presentation, I have not looked into existing research. What I've done is, I have just dumped my reflections here. So my sense is that there is already a wealth of administrative data which is available, and there is merit in considering tap. Um, but then there are very valid questions about the quality and reliability of administrative data. But for that, the answer is not to switch to something else, but to actually try and think of ways to improve the administrative data. Now, those are the first three points really regarding uh, admin, administrative data and its potential. Then there is the question of what constitutes evidence. I would say it really needs to be situated within the real world policy making context. Um, and then there is a point about co-designing research processes geared to answer specific policy questions. You know, co-design is a buzzword um, which is often used. Um, working closely with governments, particularly at the state and district level, you realize that co-designing is easier said than done because you have to be patient and constantly in, you know, constantly iterating about what is the important policy question. It has to be a closed door conversation. It has to be a conversation where people feel free and open to talk about their concerns about data, to talk about what evidence matters, what evidence, even if it matters, cannot be considered. And what is, what is an essential policy question which decision makers really want to know about and on which they can act? I think one of the things that we often do is that, and perhaps, I mean, you know, looking at an ideal scenario, maybe we should be aiming for that. But we often think that, you know, as researchers, if we collect high quality data, if you conduct rigorous analysis, we have done everything on our part and it is now incumbent on the policymaker or the decision maker to consider that data. But as I have tried to mention, there are practical policy considerations which go beyond what the data says. Nobody really comes and says, let's look at the dashboard and say, okay, this is going wrong, let's fix this. There are many other considerations to be honest. Um, there are certain nuances, uh, you, know, you know, which really need to be captured. If we are to lend meaning to the evidence that we are presenting to decision makers, so whatever be your primary um, data source, if it's a survey, it's a sample survey, it's an existing secondary database, it's administrative data, whatever it is, I think um, some of the complexities can only be untangled if you are going with an open mind, with them, with a semi-structured or potentially open-ended checklist and conducting some deep dives with important stakeholders. So, um, and, 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 and because, you know, just having household data and having overall trends and having experimental evidence to say, to attribute a certain outcome to an intervention is not enough because there, there are multiple stakeholders views, perceptions, interests that need to be considered. And if we capture that within an evidence, then it, 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 it just relates better to a decision maker. And then a person is in a better place to say, okay, this actually is optimal. It takes into consideration a multiplicity of views. It does not, um, you know, view, it, it takes into consideration also through the co-designing process, the key interests of the decision maker in mind. And Lastly, I think rather than surveys being the first port of call, what it should be. Um, um, I think I again got disconnected, but can somebody please confirm oh, yes. that I'm back? No, you are here. Yes. I mean, okay. You can stop the share, then it will okay. work. I see. Yeah. Okay. 
I just, I think I had just one last point to make if I, if I'm allowed to. Um, Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, I think my, you know, rather than having service as the first port of call, what is important, you know, in my view is to obviously consider primary service for its obvious strengths, which need not need any reiteration. But think about um, some of the following. One is the length of the question. I've seen questionnaires that go into hundreds of pages. Uh, it is quite laborious and torturous even for the respondents. I've often seen data sets where 40% of the variables are not even used in analysis. So rationalizing on your data collection, thinking of what variables are useful, are really useful, thinking of what data points perhaps are already available within administrative data and thinking of what evidence quantity of surveys and data points will not be able to shed light on. Um, so yeah, I mean, these are, I think that was the last slide really. Um, I'm gonna stop my, uh, stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Um, Right, I mean, you can have your video on. One second. Yeah, it was not working earlier. Great, yeah. okay. I'm sorry, the power is off, so the video will, will be bad in quality. Um, okay, no issues. So uh, now we'll go over to Moonan sir for his comments. Thank you. It was a very wonderful my experience in the data collection. Yes, you are right that the institute at the are you here? Sir, yes, sir. You are yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah. The most valid point that the administrative data sets are highly underutilized in our country. And the need of the hour is actually to see how far. Uh, the connection just dropped, or sir. Okay, Time. okay. So we do, I was able to hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Meanwhile, uh, until sir joins, there has one question came from Rajeshwari Balasubramani ma'am. Can you please reflect on testimonies and narratives of field level staff as data and the quality of the same as a way to untangle the complexities? The MIS data also, uh, uh, the next month uh, by by the 10th uh, date, uh, all, all that has to be updated. And then there is a lot of glitches in the data reporting part also. I think that is the question. If you want to take that, Maima, do you want to add anything? Do you have any question, Maima? Uh, yes, sir. Oh. Uh, so, uh, when you talked about the SHG's example and you were elaborating on the indicators, I know it's a hypothetical example, but uh, uh, do we have the infrastructure to collect such elaborate and vast data? And are they uh financially feasible in a country like india thank you yeah so yeah thanks Maima. i'll take your question first um because it's in the flow so you know one of the things that i really want to emphasize on here is that the very fact that this is administrative data means that you are not making any additional effort or you're not making any additional investment in resources at least um, in terms of collecting the data, because that data, as part of the governance of that scheme, Hello? is supposed to be available. Yeah. I'm sorry, my connection went off. No, I had to come out of my house on my mobile. No worries, we are on the same boat now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I'm audible all right now. Yes, sir, audible. Yeah, perfectly. Uh, you can enjoy the background of my, you know, my village. Yeah. Yeah, that nice to see, sir. Yeah, so I, what I was saying is that, you know, the uh, there are some pitfalls in use of administrative data because these were not intended for any, 
uh, used for research or any purpose. The ultimate objective of most of the MIS that is developed for the schemes is that they need a dashboard kind of thing. And they, you know, every day evening, somebody has to look at the dashboard and see the progress and things like that. And uh, you will hardly ever find what we call metadata. I mean, we don't find any definitions. When you look at the dashboard, you only see the number. They don't even say uh, on what date this is referring to. I mean, uh, the numbers may change by next day and you won't even know what is the reference date for the numbers, nor will you know the definition used for collecting this data or information. That is the biggest uh, issue. For example, if government makes a database of migrant labor, we don't even know what is the definition of a migrant? In fact, that is what I yeah. currently find in the discussion. Nobody has any idea about a migrant, but everybody wants a migrant database. So these are some of the issues. And the, as rightly pointed out, uh, most of the time, the researchers and the users, they don't have access to the micro data. I mean, the main database. What they access right. is the summarized to aggregated data. So the need of the hour is to make this data available after sufficient anonymization so that you no know, individual's privacy is uh, not um, given out. So we need a system where the uh, government is more uh, open in de actually disseminating the um, MIS-based data or the project data, or whatever they call, and ensure that these are anonymized but are available at the disaggregated level for use of that. And that is the that should be the primary thing we should look for. Uh, and as uh, Viru again mentioned, uh, instead of running and racing for a survey, uh, the first stage should be to look at all this administrative data and how best they can use it. The surveys are very expensive, very time consuming, though that appears to be, as you know, you pointed out, the first uh, option for most other research project is to conduct a survey. But I know very well, having spent so many decades in the field, it is becoming more and more difficult, it is extremely costly. And then to collect qualitative data becomes a very difficult job. So I think there can be no doubt that the administrative data should be better utilized um, for our policy purpose and also for evaluation and other things. But uh, people need to be much more careful when you're using this administrative data compared to a survey data. Survey data also has a problem unless you know the way it is collected or designed. But uh, my own experience in administrative data is that you know, it keeps changing without any intimation. Sometimes they suddenly change the definition of an MSME and uh, next year data will show something else. You know, you will never know what has happened <laughs> and there'll be no yeah. information about this kind of changes. But this is a good thing that, you know, we need to keep discussing these issues. I'm very happy about uh, you know, uh, the points you have brought out. Now let us see whether the, Audience, and whether there are any questions from our uh, uh, participants today? I think you can, Swadi, you, know, you will take up that point. Are there any questions in your chat box? Or? Yes, sir. two questions have come. One was about the narratives of field level staff, those who are doing the data entry. And Mahima has also asked a question about the capacity and infrastructure facilities, especially at the ground level, so that the data is more periodic and reliable. Abhirup, would you like to take those? Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Um, um, first of all, thank you, Monan sir, and complete agreement about the quality and reliability question. Um, this is something that um, needs to be addressed. Um, Mahima, I was, I was actually, yeah, I was responding to a question. Yeah, you said whether we have the adequate resources and capacity and infrastructure to collect the data. First of all, you know, using the SAG example because that's the one you pointed out. You don't have to collect any additional data more and beyond what is already required for you to be done as part of being a member of an SEG under a state rural livelihood mission. So in other words, what I'm saying is, so if you, and these, some of these reforms are already happening in, um, in the states of, I think Andhra Pradesh, Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, but I may be wrong. We have to go and check. Wherein you are actively looking at digitizing some of these data, 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 which is, so, you know, what happens in an SHG, you go there, there's rich data, which is available in the, uh, in the SHG books that they maintain. And there's a designated SHG bookkeeper, as you know, they are supposed to maintain records of every meeting. They're supposed to maintain records of what they're discussing, the financial um, records, interloaning, um, bank linkages, passbooks, everything. So the moment you digitize, you're just transferring an existing manual physical stack into a digital stack. 
So there is no additional um, you know, investment other than the technological investment. So for example, I think there's a concept of tablet Didi. I think it's in Jharkhand where they're essentially giving out these tablets a designated SSG bookkeeper. So the entire process gets digitized and it's at the back end gets integrated. So apart from the tech investment, I don't think there is any additional investment in um, resources or infrastructure or anything. So, and, and, and because we have anyway moved to CAPI for now more than a decade now, where we conduct very large surveys, I think that infrastructure, I do not perceive that to be a problem. Yeah, large amounts of unstructured data may be a problem. Uh, unstructured data in the sense that, you know, having minutes of meetings, having that record, being able to analyze that, of course, those are problems. Yeah, I hope that answers Thank you, the sir. question. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Right, right. Um, um, on that SSG part, let me also add one question, Aviru, that when we look at this uh, uh, big data, MIS, and when we are trying to create some impact through policy, for SSG also, we see that we have around uh, you know, around 7 million SSGs, more than that, those who are registered and all. And uh, last year also government introduced some credit and uh, other things also, a marketplace for SSGs really. Uh, but then the penetration stops. Uh, the same the same incidence was there also in the health, uh, when uh, PMJ and other health centers, only 10,000 or so. So the number we see as overall 10,000, 15,000, it, it looks very fascinating, but time and again, only a few, the, the impact is being limited. How do you see the, the, the universe, the data which we are collecting and the impact we are being able to uh, do in this process? How do you see th this happening? Yeah, no, I think that's a very valid question and a concern. I think obviously we are a few years away from that image, right? Um, in term, so the question really is of scale from what I understand. Um, the pilots are happening. The question is of scale, which is to say that at a massive scale, whether you will be able to have this high quality, reliable, routine administrative data, um, mm -hmm. and particularly ones that are digitized and have some automat automated validations and quality. So I think the question really is a matter of scale now. And that is a function of, into my mind, three things. One is technology, uh, reduction in costs in internet, um, and having the you know, skills and capacity to uh, actually implement such a vast uh, project. But other than that, I don't see why if something is, I mean, so that's classic question of an RCP. If something is happening in a pilot, that the scaling up is a whole new ballgame altogether. But as a proof of concept, what I'm seeing, administrative data and its potentials are quite vast. But yeah, I agree with your point that, the, you know, to be able to reach that coverage, I think we are still quite far away from that. And that needs technological investment. I think there are two uh, questions. Or, yeah, sorry. There are two, I just saw there are two questions. I think the, on the chat box. Um, mm -hmm. I, I will take those. Uh, the, the webinar, which Mohan sir was also referring public data, uh, which APU, uh, was conducting there also Professor John Dre has also highlighted the point which Aviru made uh, that our MIS system needs to be reliable and strengthened uh, not that we need some uh, more multinational uh, or others coming and then producing data because our statistical system is really good uh, so much so that uh, before the pandemic also our NSO and all the systems, even the surveys also, very important surveys which we do, they also said that within six months we will uh, publish the data with all the validation and others. Uh, how do you see going ahead this changing in our national uh, policy or evidence generation process? Uh, but before that, uh, Arjun is here, Arjun Sujit Verma, and uh, he's uh, our researcher and also studies at Jindal. Arjun, uh, quickly have your question. Thank you, sir. Uh, Aviru, uh, Dr. Aviru, it was great uh, uh, webinar. Uh, my question is basically, it refers back to this particular webinar that uh, Impri had conducted, I think, uh, earlier this month, where uh, uh, Pritika, uh, Pritika Hingorani uh, at the IDFC Institute, uh, we were mainly talking about, they were mainly talking about urban planning and um, the rank, uh, ranking of uh, in 
uh, indexes um, within the urban ranking, uh, urban planning uh, field. And she, she had mentioned this particular point of using uh, satellite imagery to uh, really get to, uh, of um, really looking at certain, of deriving data. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I really agree, that the, uh, I really agree to the fact that the use of surveys are very costly and very uh, time consuming. Like, how, how do you look at uh, satellite imagery as an additional source uh, for deriving um, a, a data? Right, let me also explain this, that how do we see the, the use of GIS or location, even for all the toilets, all the PMAY, yeah. uh, also, so we have that, but the penetration is 2%, 3%. Uh, I mean, one can never make use of those data. Uh, how do you see this advance going on also with our statistical system? Let me also add one question, uh, which has come by anonymous attendee. Uh, hello, do you have any recommendation for dissemination of Indian official statistical data as it suffers from issues of lag, fragmented availability? Do you have any suggestion for dashboard? or uh, other thing that how to disseminate this uh, really quick because most of the time when you know data comes a lot of debate happens then after various push then people make it that okay make it public and let researchers do their job uh, but the usability is, is very less for example the employment data government itself and niti are not acknowledging their own employment data so we don't have any statistics uh, how do you see about the dissemination point and the use of technology especially the gis and the geotagging as arjun is also highlighting yeah i think uh, yeah i'll take these questions uh, arjun uh, i have to admit that you know while i cursorily have engaged with the use of satellite imagery and I, I'm not an expert. So I don't know whether generating those images or use of night lights and stuff like that really, to what extent it adds value, I'm sure it does, but I am not an expert in, in, in those areas. So I reserve my comment, but I have one larger point to make. Whether it is the use of satellite imagery, whether it is the use of drones, there's a lot that is being proposed and perhaps also being used um, whether it is, you know, whether it is even looking at social media data and stuff like that. You know, in theory, there is a lot of potential, but I feel like there needs to be a better use case. Obviously, the proof of concept is there, but I think the use cases need to be more varied for it to make a dent. But I mean, let us be honest about one thing, the pace at which technology has progressed in the past decade and is constantly progressing. Um, let us be, you know, I think we all have to humble in acknowledging one thing that, you know, no researcher is able to predict uh, the way in which a new technology will suddenly come up and dramatically change the way we do things, whether it is we, um, whether it is the way we work, whether it is the way we conduct surveys and stuff like that. So, you know, whenever we use the word tech, I think it's very difficult for us to be ahead of the curve. We'll always be behind the curve as far as I understand it. And the only reliable way to gauge is when, if you see enough use cases of it being deployed and uh, adding to the evidence base in a meaningful way for decision makers. Uh, regarding Dr. Kumar's question on GIS, uh, GIS uh, geotagging, I think you know your question, I mean, this is something that you previously asked as well about the coverage. There are two things. One is the usefulness of a certain innovation. And that, that is proven through a proof of concept. How much we are able to rapidly scale up and reach a point of universal coverage is obviously a question of um, not so much the design itself, but so much, but about the resources, investment capacity to actually scale it up in a vast manner. So, you know, in theory, as a matter of a proof of concept, obviously, it, it is great to have geolocations of toilets. And your question about the coverage is very valid. But, you know, let's be honest, that question of coverage can be addressed in one fell swoop. If suddenly, someday, we have a technology which is much cheaper, which is much easily uh, adaptable and, you know, widely usable. So yeah, I mean, your question of scale is very valid, but that's a different ballgame altogether. Whether we have the money, investment, capacity, and resources to scale it up. 
But the question of admin data is that that wealth of data is already available. So there is no additional collection effort. Right. Uh, let me take this last question also that uh, what are some of the ethical consideration in data collection that the system in India are not able to adhere to? Can one standard be ensured globally or does context have to be given uh, relevance? For instance, should respondents be compensated for the time they spare for survey, etc.? Uh, so really digging into the quality aspect from the respondents part and what can what are the practices? Yeah. Yeah, I think quality is one aspect and that is obviously something that's very important. But I think this question is more about the ethics bit. Um, you know, whoever has asked this question, I really want to point out that this is a very valid question. Um, should respondents be compensated for the time they spare for surveys is a tricky question. I mean, see, there are, we usually borrow our concepts from the West and um, Usually, we do not have any, you know, system of monetary benefits, you know, for sparing time for a survey. And in fact, that is somehow seen as, somehow that is seen as unethical. Whereas your question is in fact about whether that should be a practice, given the fact that somebody is actually sparing a lot of time. And that is a sentiment that I agree with particularly from my own experiences in the field where I have seen a survey go as long as three hours for a person who's perhaps a, you know, daily wage laborer. Uh, in the case of a woman, perhaps there are household chores to look up to because of existing social norms. I've seen two and a half hour surveys of pregnant women and you know, to be honest, the ethical lines, how and where we draw it really needs to be well thought through, particularly in the context of the fact that the people we actually survey, most of them, for most of them, three hours lost is actually a monetary value lost. And uh, for women, there are other complications and dimensions. I do not know the solution or the answer to it right now, whether we should be monetarily compensating. Um, but I think one of the things that we must do, and I have tried to mention that uh, in my uh, presentation is that we let's just at least first make an attempt to rationalize on our data collection. You know, I have seen people say, we are going to the field anyway, let's go and collect this data. Anyway, we are going there, let's collect this data. You know, obviously, because there's a cost effectiveness value to it. So there's a value for money consideration. And so we are going to this particular village. There's a lot of cost involved. We are eventually targeting a household and you've finally entered the household. You're finally established contact with the respondent. So why not collect all the data that we can? This is the sentiment that is that I've often heard. Yeah, but you know. It's, it's really a trade-off. I mean, I really don't have an answer, but uh, perhaps we should be looking at rationalizing data collection for sure and more respect for respondents' time. I, uh, that is, uh, you know, and how we arrive to that, that must be, uh, that is definitely a matter of discussion. But in terms of sentiment, I think in terms of at least principles, I agree that these are valid questions, right? So we cannot take for granted that a respondent is going to sit there and give three hour long responses just because you want to conduct a survey. Let's be honest about it. Right. <clears throat> Many of the, the uh, private firms now also use it that you have to do uh, this survey within half an hour. A lot of things in that respect is also coming, but uh, really tough to integrate in our whole structure. So thank you very much, uh, Viruka. Really, uh, I think really uh, these data discourses are really important to ponder upon. So with that, let me uh, uh, give the uh, podium to Mohan sir for his concluding comments so that uh, we can wrap up this important deliberation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arjun. This has been a very lively session and I have seen, uh, of course, it is slightly deviated from the original intention of uh, 
approved by going into the survey programs and methodologies. I'm very familiar with the topics we should not bring uh, providing so much time for the surveys. And unfortunately, we have this tendency of telephone surveys. Everybody thinks now that, you know, these telephone surveys are so easy. Uh, and there is a recommendation that you know, all, all of us will start uh, collecting data using telephone surveys. Now, telephone surveys, is it's you know, um, how good it is compared to a face-to-face -face interview. There are many, many issues. It's a Abhiru Vestas today, and I fully agree with that about the respondent being made to sit for so long. And because the survey miners have decided to collect as much information as possible on the survey just because of the economy. So these are all issues to be, you know, I think probably the dialogue continues like this. We can discuss in due course in your meeting. Um, the choice of uh, issues when it in its reflections on the ecosystem. And then the example I think is a very good thank you thank you so much Manan, sir. so with that uh, we thank all of you for joining this deliberation and formally uh, on behalf of uh, in pre-generation alpha data center general Alpha dc uh, thank you everyone for joining our, our special series the state of statistics data discourses and today's talk on practitioners' reflection on the data and evidence ecosystem uh, by uh, Mr. Viru Bhumiya, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for putting forth let all just, your... Um, yeah, I know you want to close, but let me just quickly also say thank you to everybody, Dr. Kumar, Mohan, yeah. sir. Um, you know, so yeah, let me just take the opportunity to thank everyone for organizing it and for patiently hearing me out. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we also like to thank our chair, uh, PC Mohan, sir. Uh, for sharing this deliberation despite being uh, connection issues uh, everyone participated and thank you to all the participants and uh, who joined here on zoom and uh, watched on facebook live and later will watch at uh, youtube and uh, listen on our podcast and we do hope that you'll join on our future episodes of the our series the state of statistics hashtag data discourses uh, thank you very much uh, have a nice evening and please take care